This is a small flower. To which group does this flower belong? Group A on the left or group B on the right? A group. A group. B group. A 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 种属于 B 组的 ，A 组吧 ，A 组，啊、哦、，B， 哎 ，B，B。B. A belongs to B. A B. B. It belongs to B. B. Um, A. B. Interestingly, Easterners from Korea, China, and Japan mostly answered Group A, while Westerners from the U.S. and the U.K. said Group B. What is the source of this difference? Do people from the East and the West typically see the world in a different way? Westerners generally see space as something that is mostly empty. Westerners tend to envision space as the thing in which planets float. The objects in empty space exist independently of their surroundings. But to Easterners, space has been believed since ancient times to be filled with energy known as ghi. Objects made from ghi are always closely related to the surrounding ghi. In the West, objects are thought to exist in empty space, while in the East, objects are seen as being made from ghi. From this small difference in perspective, stems the difference between East and West. In Western thought process, if two objects are separated, they don't really affect each other. The reason is that the space between them is empty. In Eastern thought, however, the two separate objects affect each other anyway. In the East, all objects are made of ghi, and all things are related through this ghi. It is in this way that ancient scholars in the East came to realize the tides were the result of interaction between the Earth and the Moon. The ancient Chinese uh, understood the concept of gravity. Uh, they understood the the notion that there can be action at a distance; that one object can be distant from another, and it still can operate on it. And it's amazing to us today, but the Greeks did not understand that. In fact, it's amazing that until the late 18th century, the West believed that there was no such thing as action in a distance. Whereas 2,500 years ago, 
the Chinese understood the basic principles of acoustics, they understood magnetism, uh, and they even understood the true reason for the tides. Um, and this was unknown even to Galileo. Galileo had many interesting theories about why the tides exist, and all of them were wrong, whereas the Chinese had gotten it right 2,500 years before because they were paying attention between the relationship between the, conte the context and the object. Everything in space operates on every other thing. This notion of universal interactivity is well represented in Japanese gardens. This is a wooden cylinder. Let's call it docks. Between a wooden box-like shape and a plastic blue cylinder, which one could be called docks? This is a box. A box. Docks. Yep. Which one is a box? Um. Uh, Because it's round like this one. Yeah. Uh, I would say that one. Why? Why? Because it's the same, similar shape. The colour doesn't matter. Which one is that dog? Um, that one. Why? Same shape. <laughs> Which one is that dog? That one. Why? Because it's got a, that one's got a curve like. That, and that one's got two circles there, and this, this is both the same, but they're different colour. Yeah. You know? Yeah. It's the same thing. 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 It's the same なんで。だって同じだから木。あ、そっか。木でしょ木でしょだから。え、こっち。あ、取ってる。はい。その理由は何ですか素材が一緒だから。素材というか、木の木目とか。うーん。材が分かる。うん。目線のな。似合ってる
but there is no such clear distinction in Eastern languages. Chinese don't say eat one particular orange. They don't say that. In English, you have to say eat this apple, eat an apple, you know, or apple a day. I mean, you know, we have to, uh, in the English language, have to use that. In the Chinese, you don't, you don't have to, you, you, because you have to pay attention to the context. It's the habits of your thoughts, so you don't need, need to emphasize that, um, you know, specific uh, quantity of objects. You're supposed to know. Uh, in English language, uh, they want to be very clear and specific. By the way, that's how the kids in the United States react sometimes. Like teachers say, go eat some fruit. Then the kids say, which fruit you were talking about? You want to eat that? one banana, one apple, one strawberry? You don't get this kind of uh, complaints from Asian kids. They, they just, oh, I'm going to eat it. And they know what you mean. Westerners tend to emphasize the individuality of objects. Wholeness refers to a collection of individual things. But to Easterners, wholeness refers to a lump without any distinct individualness. In other words, oneness. Different brain operations are typically undertaken when Easterners and Westerners see objects in a picture. Basically, in the back of your head, there's areas of the brain that are associated um, primarily with perception. And so the brain, when it sees a picture, has to interpret all those forms and shapes and curves. And what we see is that when an Asian brain sees a picture, it looks at the picture as a whole and doesn't, the, the, uh, the area in the brain that pays attention to individual objects doesn't activate so much. Whereas for an American, when they look at the same picture, their brain actually um, focuses on individual objects, and the part of their brain that understands what an individual object is is what will activate more. While Easterners see the picture as a whole, Westerners see objects separately. Some of this difference is evident in the vocabularies mothers use to their children. Western mothers tend to use more nouns. What kind of special truck is it? I don't know. What kind of truck is that called? I don't know. It's not sand, it's water. Oh, the water, is it orange water? Or blue water? Or green water? Green water. Green water? Yep. And where are we going to take it? I don't know. Okay. To the hospital. To the hospital? Yeah, there's this medicine water. Oh, it's special medicine water, okay. While Eastern mothers typically use more verbs. Many years ago, in the 1980s, I think uh, a, a group of Harvard linguistics found that uh, in English language, there are too many norms. They call the norm bias. And, and some people will look at the uh, how kids in the Western societies or, or English language culture environments, how they talk, they find that they use a lot of norms as well. Uh, you know, Nisbet has this uh, famous uh, example when, you, when, when he goes to supermarket and he finds this uh, American mother's young, teach this young American baby, what is this? This apple, what is that? That's orange. It's all about the norm. And what's interesting is that uh, Trila Tadev, who is a linguistics from Michigan, she went to China, look at the, how the Chinese mothers and talk to their own kids. They find that there are lots of uh, verbs like sit, eat, run, do things. You know, it's very much about uh, 
actions. So that's an interesting question there, is that why you get those uh, cultural differences. Why did Western languages develop with a noun focus and Eastern languages with a verb focus? Let's take the example of a person drinking tea. When asking whether more tea is wanted, there is a clear difference in terms used. Westerners typically ask, more tea? With an emphasis on the noun tea. An Easterner, however, might typically say, drink more, focusing on the verb drink. The verb drink expresses the operation between people and tea. Easterners typically think of the interactions between individual people or objects, so they tend to use more verbs. On the other hand, Westerners may focus on the people and tea as separate objects, so the noun tea is used in their suggestions. So Westerners use nouns to express individualness, and Easterners use verbs as an expression of interactions. In other words, the West typically sees the world with nouns, and the East sees it with verbs. For Easterners, everything in space is constantly changing. To the typical Easterner, everything is the result of these interactions with the surroundings. This chrysanthemum is part of this interaction. It is the result of many interactions with the surroundings over a long time. Many objects are created and disappear as a result of many causations. In Buddhism, this is called yonyi, which means arising from conditional causation. Yonyi refers to the idea that everything arises from conditions, and not being spontaneous and self-contained has no separate and independent nature. In English, it can be translated as arising. In the West, objects are typically referred to as being, considering them as stationary objects. Arising, or bringing about, is a verb in the East. Being means existing, and it is stationary in the West. This illustrates nicely the different vantage points from the East and the West. Consider the question, why is this object blue? To Westerners, the cause is inside the object, because the surroundings are empty. In Eastern thought, the space is filled with ghee, and the objects are a concentration of this ghee. Therefore, the object is blue because of the surrounding ghee. This blue object is closely related to the objects around it, meaning there might be more complicated operations causing its blueness. Easterners typically think the cause and effects are complex. But when I was in Japan, I was reading newspaper articles. Sometimes people would get hit by a train or a subway car and, and be killed. And these newspaper articles would very often finish with how many people were delayed, how many minutes they were delayed, how many trains were delayed or canceled because um, of this accident. In the United States, you would never see this information. It would just be, you know, it's too bad, a tragic incident, someone was killed, and that's it. And the Japanese journalists focused on 
all of these indirect effects, people delayed, trains delayed. When accidents occur, Easterners might imagine more causations than do Westerners. 사람들의 행동이라는 것이 무엇에 의해서 결정되느냐? 동양 사람들은 사람이라고 하는 게 어떤 전체적인 맥락 속에 속해 있기 때문에 그 맥락에서 일어나고 있는 조그만 변화에 의해서도 사람들의 행동 영향을 받기 때문에 굉장히 다양한 요인들 고려해야 되지만 서양 사람들은 사람이라고 하는 게 맥락과는 좀 독립적인 하나의 어떤 완결된 주체라고 보기 때문에 그 사람 내부에 있는 것만으로도 설명이 충분하다. 라고 보는 인간관에서의 차이에서 이런 차이들이 비롯된다고 볼 수가 있겠죠. Westerners think of a cause for an object as residing inside. When an object is broken down into smaller parts, the result in English is called an atom. The origin of this word means uncut. Suggesting it can't be broken down anymore. The Greek philosopher Democritus hypothesized that the property of an object depends on that of its atoms. The atoms of water, for example, are sleek and round, so water flows. Atoms of iron, he thought, are coarse and tough. So iron is strong and hard when they are together. Atoms of sweetness would be large and round. Those of saltiness would be triangular. These illustrate how everything was seen as the result of these properties. Ancient Western thought supposed that the cause of atoms' movement was their property and weight. In Aristotle's physics, uh, the behavior of objects is completely explained by the properties of the object. So uh, Aristotle says you drop a stone into water and the stone sinks because the stone has the property of gravity. But there's this problem, if you put a piece of wood in the water, the wood floats. Why is that? Well, because the wood has the property of levity. And of course, we understand that that's just completely wrong. I mean, objects don't have the property of gravity. Gravity is a relationship between one object and another. A scene of a red balloon floating away evokes different responses from Easterners and Westerners. So you have this balloon just coming, suddenly accelerate by itself. Then we ask people, why do you think this balloon accelerate by itself? American students tend to say, well, maybe it just lose air. So it's about the object itself. And Chinese will say, oh, maybe there's wind coming. We didn't show wind, we didn't show anything, but they have a different response. While Westerners think that objects' properties control their behavior, Easterners imagine that those behaviors are the result of their surroundings. When Westerners think a person is kind, the cause is the kindness of the person. Western psychology is mistaken in that if they see a person behaving in a particular way, they see the person behaving in a way that seems to be kind, they say, oh, well, the person's very kind. Or if it seems to be rude, the person is very rude. They tend not to look at the context. And you can show that Westerners make big mistakes because they're, they're, they're assuming something that's wrong, that the person has a disposition or a personality trait that corresponds to the behavior that they've seen. So they generalize too much from it because they're just paying attention. They, they assume that the reason people behave the way they do is because they have certain properties that they carry around with them. To many Easterners, however,
people can be kind and rude at the same time. A person's behaviors are decided and determined depending on the behavior of others. This can be loosely summed up as what goes around comes around. This is a happy person. The people around him look happy too. The background people in the second picture look unhappy. So, can the person with the smile on his face be happy? Is this person look happy? Uh, yeah. What about him? The same one? Uh, yeah, I would say so. That he looks happy. I believe happy. Okay. I'd like to believe happy. What about him? That one? Are they different? I don't know. I, I would say that one's happy as well. He's happy, yes. What about him? He looks the same to me. He looks happy too. Is he happy? Yes. He looks like it. What about him? Yeah. He still looks kind of happy. Uh, North Americans in general are likely to focus only on the center of the scene, which means the center person. Yes, this is a task, you know, they can nicely focus on the center and they try to guess the patterns, uh, the, the uh, center of figure's facial expression. And then even though the background has been changed, like a angry background, sad background, and a happy background, they do not care so much about it. Okay, which means that they are nicely produced a consistent evaluation to us, the same type of facial expressions. 여기 가운데 있는 사람은 행복합니까? 네. 그럼 이 그림에서 가운데 있는 사람은 행복한가요? 행복하지 않은 것 같은데요? 응. 이유는 그냥 다들 주변 사람들이 불행하잖아요. 幸せです。まあ、真ん中の人は幸せですか？いや、そんなことないですね。あ、その理由はどうしてですか？いや、周りの人の表情が怒ってる。ああ。幸せです。笑ってんのが自分だけだから。如果我光看他感觉是高兴的，但是如果看后面的，好像是有点尴尬或者怎么样，就是无奈的，我要笑笑，因为解释怎么样的，就说不上高兴的感觉。对对对。Japanese are strongly influenced by the changes in the background facial expressions. Uh, which means that uh, if you are presented with happy background, the happy center person uh, are seen as uh, much more happier than the case that they are presented with the sad background or neutral background. The eye movements of Easterners and Westerners are studied as they view a tiger in the jungle. What we find is that the Americans focus in on the most salient object. They spend nearly all their time in this looking at the tiger, for example. Uh, and Asians spend much more time looking at the background, and especially looking back and forth between the background and the object, looking back and forth between the jungle and the tiger. So they make more eye movements, and they make more movements between the background and the object, so they see more about the background, and they see more about the relationships between what's in the background and what's in that salient object. In Eastern thought, the property of an object can differ depending on where it is. So a tiger in a zoo or the circus is conceived differently from one in the jungle.
Depending on its venue, the property of the tiger changes. This surrounding milieu can be called the field. Objects belong to the field around them, in what is known as the situation. Easterners can tend to overanalyze the situation of an object because the situation decides its properties. Traditional portraits in the East have broad backgrounds. Typical portraits in the West include smaller perspectives or torsos. These differences can be spotted in modern society. We asked college students from Eastern and Western countries to take pictures of their friends. Western students mostly took large pictures of faces with a small background. Eastern students tried to find a balance between the people and the background. This uh, comes from my real experiences. And um, when I went to North America, and I have a chance to go to the party, and everybody taking uh, one the picture each other. Then after that, you know, my friend showed me, oh, this is a picture that we've taken uh, last party. Then I'm surprised that uh, my size is quite large, you know, compared to my expectation. And then the person, my friend, focuses only on my face while ignoring the background. And then. Well, I said, oh, this seems to be a, you know, big face, you know, but uh, he said, oh, because, you know, I'm focusing on you, you know, I just, uh, I think it's a good idea to make the, your picture, your face large, okay? So, uh, that's a kind of astonishing, you know, experience, yes? But uh, I found that, oh, wait a minute, okay, so they really want to see the focal object uh, while nicely ignoring the background. But uh, my experience is in my country, you really have to uh, in take into account of the contextual factor when you go to the shrine or something like that, or temples, so you know, famous temples and shrines, uh, you might want to ask your friends to take a picture not only for you, but also you and the, the buildings, right? Easterners take pictures whenever the background changes. They enjoy different images of themselves with new backgrounds. Children are asked to draw pictures of their houses. This experiment results in some interesting contrasts. Western children imagine their home from their own eye level. Eastern children take a bird's eye view in their pictures. In East Asian society, uh, it seems to be natural to see yourself from outside. You are also the part of the society. If you take a, uh, you know, uh, inside person's point of view, you are going to observe this world from your eyes. Okay, you are always the center, but the yourself is not visible. Okay, so everything uh, occurs to you is just come in front of your eyes, and then you cannot see yourself. Whereas, you know, uh, East Asian society, uh, you, you can even uh, contextualize yourself. 
Okay, if you take outsider's point of view, you are also in the part of the group, part of the society. When you take a look at uh, East Asian paintings, uh, you can easily identify that uh, they take a bird's eye view, which is not uh, completely different techniques to uh, compared to the Western perspective. With some perspective, you really have to set up uh, the viewer's point. Once you fix it, you cannot move. Okay, you really have to, uh, you know, experience that you are. Uh, just uh, standing in front of the images. And based on that assumption, they draw uh, three-dimensional, like uh, with some perspective images. Whereas uh, East Asian drawing in general is uh, like a, something like a, the painter is actually flying uh, on the sky and uh, try to observe all the field information from the sky. The interaction of yin and yang is the representative principle of Eastern thought. Yin is the shade, and yang is the sunshine. According to this principle, no object exists without a partner, just like sunshine and shade. Here we have a monkey, a banana, and a panda. If two of them are to be grouped together, which ones should they be? Um, the panda and the monkey, because they're both animals. Uh, the panda bear and the monkey. Uh, because they're both animals and they're both mammals as well. The panda and the monkey go together? Why? Because they're both animals? Monkey and the panda go together because they're both mammals, whereas the banana is a fruit. Panda and monkey, why? Because they're animals? One type of study that we do is that we show people triads of pictures, three pictures three different objects, and we say, which of these two go together? And it might be something like uh, banana, panda, monkey. And the Americans say, well, the monkey and the panda go together because both of them are animals. Uh, but the East Asians are much more likely to say, the monkey goes with the banana because monkeys eat bananas. So the uh, Americans, the Westerners, are seeing the world in terms of, of categories, like animal and so on, and these are not as salient to uh, East Asians. They're much more likely to see the world in terms of relationships, like monkey eats banana. When Westerners see objects, they separate them from their background. By looking at them this way, they simultaneously interpret their meaning. We found that the Americans showed more activation in their brains in the middle temporal gyrus. That's a part of the brain that's associated with contacting the meaning of objects. Westerners separate objects and interpret their meaning. Separating and interpreting is analysis. Its origins are in the separating process. Westerners see objects through this analysis, which functions like instinct. 
Does the flower in the center belong to group A or group B? Easterners choose group A because the flowers look alike. This flower has roundish petals. Flowers in group A have roundish petals as well. Flowers in group B are pointed, so Easterners choose group A. Westerners, on the other hand, see this picture from a different perspective. They analyze the petals and the stalk. One flower in group A has pointed petals, so no consistency. Comparing the stalks, though, all of the flowers in group B are straight. Consistency. That's why Westerners choose group B. For Westerners. The world is a collection of separate individuals. Westerners wanted chaotic individuals in the world to be arranged in order. That's why Westerners tend to make categories depending on the properties of the objects. I think analytic thinking. Uh, you start with. The object, you pay attention to the properties of the object. Could be a person, a thing, or a person. You categorize the object on the basis of、um, its properties. You bring rules about the categories at a somewhat more abstract level to bear on what the, what the, how the object will behave given the rules that apply to the categories that it fits. <laughs> Categorizing things brings great advantage. It helps knowledge build up over time. From this stems scientific development. The word science, which originates from this concept, means separate. Science has the origin, meaning separate. This separation means a lot to Westerners. Sculptors in ancient Greece exemplified this analytic thought process. They believed that the beauty of an object came from a proper proportion of each part. This was known as the golden ratio. They sculpted their works according to this golden ratio rule. Even the word reason comes from the word ratio. For Westerners, the world is a collection of individual objects. For Easterners, on the other hand. The world is a big field where everything is related and interconnected. Westerners see the world as individually expressed nouns, and Easterners see the world as verbs that express the interactions between the objects. <laughs>